So I was recently, this past spring, invited into a local elementary school to talk to some fourth graders about climate change. So I put together what I thought were some age-appropriate slides with you know nice pictures, and I took them on a trip around the world to talk about climate change and how it was manifesting. And when I started talking about sea ice loss, I showed a picture of the Arctic, the Arctic Circle, and how sea ice had been retreating over time. And a little boy in the front row says, well, what's going to happen to Santa Claus and his home? <laughs> And I wasn't exactly prepared to answer that question, but, um, you know, just like Santa Claus, people in Colorado are having to adapt to the impacts of climate change. And so I'm really pleased to be here to talk with you tonight to represent EPA Region 8 and our new regional administrator, Sean McGrath, he's a former mayor. He was the mayor of Boulder, Colorado um, in the mid-2000s, early 2000s, um, about the time that uh, I was a mayor of the Netherlands. So he's a great guy, and he came in and he said to us that his top priority is taking action on climate change, as did our new EPA administrator, Gina McCarthy, who was just confirmed by Congress last month. So the release of the President's Climate Action Plan was really well timed, because not only EPA, but the other federal agencies were really eager to start working on this issue. And he has tasked us with reducing carbon pollution from power plants. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I'm actually going to talk a lot about that, so I hope you're <laughs> particularly interested in that. Advancing renewable energy, uh, building a 21st century transportation sector, cutting waste, um, cutting energy waste rather in homes, businesses, and factories, reducing other kinds of greenhouse gases and CO2 like methane and hydrofluorocarbons, and Something that I've been working on a lot is preparing for the impacts of climate change, climate change adaptation. So let's talk about Section 111 of the Clean Air Act. So it's a special part of the Clean Air Act where EPA has the authority to regulate pollutants from all different kinds of sources. We have the authority to regulate greenhouse gas emissions from different sections of that. So Section 111B, I know this is going to bore you to death. If there are law students, you're going to eat this up. But Section 111B actually allows us to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. And this is important because people are going to fight us on this. But we have the authority to do this under 111B um, for, uh, for new, modified, and reconstructed uh, power plants. But under Section 111D, it's a very, very special section of the Act that allows us to work on pollutants that we don't have the authority to do so under different parts of the Act. So, the National Ambient Air Quality Standards for Criteria of Pollutants are one part of the Act where we cannot regulate greenhouse gas emissions. The National Emiss Emission Standards for Hazardous Air Pollutants is another section of the Act where we cannot work on greenhouse gases. So Section 111D says all those areas, all those other pollutants that aren't covered by areas of the Act, you can do that here under this particular section. So we're really capitalizing on that, and the President was very specific that we should use that part of the Act to reduce power plant emissions. So that's what we're going to be doing, and through this, we're really hoping to spark innovation and to really move the industry toward using cleaner technologies and more innovation, um, and to really modernize power plants by helping them um, look to the latest technologies that are available, and to look at you know really uh, different ways of approaching the problem, and really moving the economy towards using cleaner sources of energy. So what EPA needs to do, and we've got a really ambitious schedule that was set by the President to do this. Um, so what we're going to be doing first, and what we have been doing for a while, is we actually propose standards for new power plants back in April 2012. From that proposal, we received 2.0 million public comments. So that slowed down the process because, of course, we have a responsibility to respond to those comments. And if any of you commented on that rule, thank you. But now we're asked to propose that rule by the end of September of this year. So we're moving really fast in terms of doing that. But we need to engage stakeholders in doing this. Particularly, we need to work with the states because they're the ones that are going to be implementing these standards. We're going to be working with tribes because some of them own or operate uh, power plants. Obviously, we're working with the power sector because they're, you know, 
they're our client in all of this. We need to work with them because they need to make this happen in partnership with us. We're going to be working with labor leaders, environmental organizations, and members of the public. So just yesterday we held a webinar with states and tribes where we walked them through this Section 111 process. And the reason we did that is because we really want them to understand how it works and what the possibilities are for creating a flexible, common-sense approach here. And we had a really great turnout, and you can see this webinar. It's about 30 minutes long, and it'll give you all the details that you want to know about what we're going to be doing in the process. Um, and you can find it at epa.gov slash carbon pollution standard. So it's a section of EPA's website that's fairly new, and it's going to walk you through everything that we're going to be doing. So I really encourage you to check that out. And if there's any law students here who really want to get more information on this, you can check out 40 CFR Part 60, and it, it will show you all of the different sources that have been regulated previously under Section 111D, so how that part of the Act really works. So we're going to be following up with teleconferences with different stakeholders in September. You all are, are welcome to participate in these. So on September 9th, we're going to be talking with states and communities via teleconference. And on September 12th, with industry and environmental groups. So you're more than welcome to participate. Go to that website that I just gave you, and you can find out when and how you can participate. The President's plan also directs EPA to continue to work on developing fuel economy standards for motor vehicles. And it's one of the things that we've been doing that we think has really gotten um, some good greenhouse gas emissions. So we've been working with um, the auto industry on this, they've been a good partner and we've been able to achieve fuel, advanced fuel economy um, and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So this new charge that the President has given us is to work with heavy duty vehicles because they're a section of, of, of the transportation sector that really has a lot of emissions and they've been a tough one. So the President has asked us specifically to pass standards for them for post-2018 vehicles using even more advanced technology. So we really think that working uh, with the auto industry has really brought about a lot of innovation. And it's created jobs, and so we think that's one of the cornerstones of what EPA has the ability to do that's reducing greenhouse gas emissions. But we're also going to be looking at improving the efficiency of moving goods around the country. And we've got a great program that we're really proud of called the SmartWay program. I don't know if any of you have heard about it, but it's a collaboration with the freight industry. So we're working with shippers and we're working with carriers and logistic companies to help them look at different technologies and techniques to um, improve how we move goods across the country. And it's been really, uh, it's been really effective. So large companies like Horizon Container um, have been working with EPA, so they're getting free technical assistance from us. So they're getting advice on what kind of technologies might be the most effective for their company and they're actually saving money and reducing emissions. Another cornerstone of the President's plan is to cut energy in waste homes and businesses. And the President has called on uh, different agencies to expand and improve standards for appliances um, and other products. But it's also uh, expanding the Better Building Challenge. And EP's got the Energy Star program. A lot of you are probably familiar with that. And so, one of the best things about the Energy Star program is what's called the Energy Star Portfolio Manager. So it lets building owners go into the system where they can put in the particulars about their building, they can track their energy use, they can track their greenhouse gas emissions, they can track their utility bills. And so we're expanding it now to give them a little better user interface and the ability to really look at emissions that they're able to achieve over the whole life cycle of their building. So we're really uh, you know, advancing the capabilities of that tool. And finally, one thing that I've been working on a lot is, is climate change adaptation. And the President is really clear in his plan about what he wants federal agencies to do regarding that. And he's asking them, among other things, to start working with communities to help them prepare for the impacts of climate change. And one of the things he has asked federal agencies to do is to remove barriers that they may have and any regulations or policies or programs to create incentives um, and to look at how they can make smarter investments through the funding mechanisms that they might have. So 
that's something that we're going to be working on. He's also asked the federal agencies to start developing better information, better tools that communities can use to help them adapt. Um, and EPA, uh, you know, to meet this challenge, is going to start integrating climate change considerations in some of our funding mechanisms, like the Clean Water and the Drinking Water State Revolving Funds and our Brownfields Funds. These are two areas where we continue to get funds, even though they keep getting cut back year by year. Uh, we still continue to get funds there, so we can use those tools. But we also have a really great tool called the Climate Ready Water Utilities Program, and within it is the CREATE tool, and it's the Climate Resilience Evaluation and Awareness Tool. And so it allows water utilities to go in and put in some geographic parameters, look at what the climate change impacts might be on their operations and their infrastructure, and then help them set some goals to build resiliency. Um, speaking of resiliency, uh, the President's plan is also going to be establishing a cross-agency drought resilience partnership. I don't know if any of you have heard of this. It hasn't been launched yet, so we don't have a lot of details about it, but I think the idea is to kind of be a front door for communities who need help um, and who are affected by drought. So we look forward to seeing more about that. But it's going it, to it's going to link existing products that we have, like the National Integrated Drought Information System. Nice. But even before the president announced his plan, he issued Executive Order 13514. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it. It's called Federal Leadership in Environmental Energy and Economic Performance. It sets sustainability goals for federal agencies. And so it asked them to do things like set greenhouse gas reduction targets, increase energy efficiency, reduce their fleet. Uh, fuel use, um, increase water conservation, reduce waste, and, and practice sustainable acquisition. So we've been doing that for a while, submitting these sustainability plans to the White House. But it also established a climate change adaptation task force that has been reporting to Congress on and submitting recommendations to Congress on what they want federal agencies to do. And one of the things they wanted federal agencies to do was to develop climate adaptation plans. So 35 federal agencies developed climate adaptation plans submitted to the White House last June of 2012. They came out for public comment um, earlier this year. Some of you may have seen them. It's interesting reading. So I encourage you to go out and see what some of the federal agencies are saying. But EPA took that one step further and said, I want all of our regional offices to develop climate adaptation plans. So I just finished writing the one for EPA Region 8. That has gone to the White House with the other regional offices plan outs. We hope to have it to come out for public comment here soon, but I just want to tell you a little bit about it. We identified some climate change impacts in that plan, including increasing tropospheric ozone pollution in certain areas, reduced snowpack, earlier timing of spring events, increased frequency <coughs> and intensity of wildfires, decreasing precipitation days and increasing drought intensity, increasing risk of floods, and intensifying pest pressure in a changing mix of pest, pests. So from all of those impacts, we identified um, some priority actions that we want to take. I'm just going to tell you about a few of them. We want to work with our partners to interpret data and communicate wildfire particulate matter risks and adaptive measures to the public, uh, particularly the vulnerable populations that we serve. Consider that water quality standards might not be met, especially regarding sediments and nutrients from wildfires, fires, and how we can support response and remediation efforts. Continue education and outreach on the use of green infrastructure, not just on a small scale, but also on a large scale to protect against wildfire and drought. And how we continue how we can continue funding on the ground projects. And finally, to continue education and outreach on EPA's water sense program that some of you might be familiar with. Similar to the Energy Star program, where we're labeling efficient products, um, putting them into the marketplace place to give people a sense of what they're buying and how it measures up against other comparable products. So in closing, and in time, I believe, um, I just want to recognize that I think the state of Colorado has been doing a really great job in terms of both reducing greenhouse gas emissions and adapting to climate change. Things like the Renewable Portfolio Standard that's just recently been enhanced, um, the Commercial PACE Program that's soon to be deployed, and also the Draft Colorado Drought Mitigation and Response Plan. I don't know if any of you saw that. It was just out for public comment. So it's got some great proposed actions in it to help the state build resilience.
So I really want to thank you for listening to me. I know I was speaking very quickly. I had a lot to get through. But I look forward to talking with you more during the discussion and answer period. Four panelists, fantastic panelists. Uh, uh, none of them went over. She, she came to close us and came within six seconds, but a great, uh, great uh, foresight again, I think. Um, so we do want to move. We've got about 20 minutes or so. We can uh, we can take questions and answers, and then I think time after that, hopefully, for anybody who's got uh, time to stick around. But uh, you know, we handed out cards. I don't know if anybody wrote down a question or not, but I think if you're not too hostile. We'd be happy to take your question personally and, and uh, eliminate the middleman. Um, see one back there from Lance. I'm curious if there's going to be any budget that's going to allow the EPA to do any of this. Uh... Well, that's an excellent question. Well, we're keeping our fingers crossed on that because we've certainly seen a number of budget cuts, particularly to our staff and our other resources uh, for the past few years. So we're, we're feeling these, the pinch of that. But um, I'm encouraged by what I've been hearing. And I have a good feeling about this and that EPA might not get more resources for staff necessarily, but that we might actually start seeing some money flowing into different kinds of climate adaptation activities, not just through EPA, but through other federal agencies as well, like FEMA. Great, I have a question right here. Yes, another question for Ms. Harris. Uh -huh. um, I applaud the efforts at efficiency and conservation. I was just wondering if the president has thought about cutting subsidies to the oil and gas industry. Mm -hmm. uh, that was not mentioned in the plan. <laughs> <laughs> and other people in the room may know more about this than me because I, I have not, not I have people. not heard any chatter about that from the administration. Yeah, you said that under 111D of the Clean Air Act that they were going to be regulating or proposing to regulate some yes. pollutants that they don't regulate under other parts. Greenhouse gases. And yes. so I assume carbon emissions are there. What else beyond carbon emissions? Are you well, it could be certain air toxics. Uh, there's a handful of different rules that have been passed uh, for just particular industries and particular air toxics. The exotic ones that are not covered under the NESHAP, the National Emission Standards for Hazardous Air Pollutants. Okay. Yeah, and, and you can go to, that's why I mentioned 40 CFR Part 60. You can go there and you can see all the rules that have been written for those previous source categories. Okay, thanks. Can people hear well enough uh, the answers? There, there are the mics if you want to pull it Sorry. closer to you. One is, one is to you. Uh, Debbie? Um, Laura, you have a uh, question for you um, and also Jeannie. Um, on the national level, do you know what's happening with nationwide high speed rail? And Jeannie, how about Colorado? I don't, you know, I keep hearing that there are companies in Colorado who are developing this system where they're going to build concrete tubes and create a vacuum and shoot people through them and move their cars. And I'm sort of claustrophobic, so I'm not keen on that idea. But maybe we'll just leapfrog the whole, you know, <laughs> rail system and, and go straight to that. It's, it's supposed to be particularly efficient. There's actually a test, like a mild test of it somewhere in California. Um, and I keep, you know, I actually keep hearing about it on the news quite a bit. So I'm, I'm curious about it. But no, I, I don't really hear a lot about high speed rail across the United States on a, on a wide scale. Sorry. Um, the only um, conversations that I've heard are probably the same ones you've heard. Um, that we did some testing in Pueblo about high, high speed uh, magnetic methods of moving people and we're particularly interested in the I-70 corridor and we've had that conversation for a long time and the only uh, sort of twist on that that I've heard recently is uh, a vision uh, that um, we might combine federal funding, some state funding and some private money to um, pay for what uh, turns out to be a very expensive system up front, even though long term makes a lot of sense. Um, and the, the motive for doing that would be the Winter Olympics and wanting to 
um, the private companies that are have the ability to do this, being able to kind of showcase that as um, something that um, they can do here in Colorado where we have some um, elevation challenges and uh, that if we can do it here, we could do it many other places. So we can imagine maybe courting some private companies that would partner with us uh, to create that and because of the Olympics, it would be a way of showcasing it for a lot of people all over the world who would come to the Olympics. But that's the only conversation I've heard recently. Um, it could be that there's more information out there and because I don't serve on the transportation committee, I haven't um, kept as up to date on all those proposals, but um, that's as much as I've heard. Jim. Laura, is there anything in the in CFR 60 or 111 Part D that will um, directly or, or indirectly accelerate the deployment of renewable technologies like solar and wind? Well, my understanding of it is there's a lot of flexibility there. Uh -huh. So we can we can develop guidelines under that section that are source-based or that are system-based. So under a system-based approach, you could, a state could, take the, that idea and develop renewable portfolio standards. So, it's, yeah, so it's possible. And that's certainly one of the things that I hope we're going to be looking at. I've got, uh, yeah, go ahead, I've got a question. Um, I appreciate you all being here. I think it's wonderful hearing what the things everyone's doing. The one thing I have not heard, along maybe with the word subsidies, though, is I hear a lot of experts talk about you can do this, you can mitigate here, and the water and everything else, but nothing's going to be fast enough without a carbon tax. Sure. To, tax the, to tax the industry from the point of when the carbon is taken out of the ground. And I wonder if any of you have an opinion on that, or will we be hearing that from the EPA at any time? I don't know. I don't. I don't know if we'll be hearing that from the EPA. I don't know under what legal authority we could propose that kind of thing. Um, on a personal level, that's what I've always been in favor of versus a cap and trade system. But um, I don't. I don't know that EPA has the authority to do that. And I don't. I don't know. Um if Colorado does either, but it does seem to me that there are some things, as we pointed out tonight, that Colorado leads on, and I wonder, you know, it, what's the what's the taste for that in Colorado, Senator Davis? Well, you know, we can't tax anything um, without um, a vote of the people. Um, to um, so I'm I'm not sure um, how we would approach that. Um, I don't think that it's a terrible idea. I just think we'd have to think through how we were going to do it, and then whether there's the political will to do so. Can I ask a follow-up to Senator Nixon? Just, uh, <laughs> uh, there's a couple questions I want to get to some of these people. But, uh, is there something uh, on a wish list for you of what you think uh, uh, you'd love to see Colorado moving forward on and something we haven't done yet that you'd love to see us get moving on? I think the, the one thing that's on my wish list that we really haven't uh, wrapped our arms around is the use of woody biomass to generate um, energy. It seems like we have a significant resource in the state and we're missing the opportunity to use it. I don't uh, think that we want to denude the forest. I'm certainly not talking about taking every tree to generate electricity or to generate heat, but I think we're missing a lot of opportunity to uh, do something on a grand scale in terms of taking uh, the wood that we need to remove from the forest in order to make the forest healthy and to minimize um, uh, the risk of uh, catastrophic wildfires and use it to generate heat and generate electricity. Certainly, um, the uh, idea of generating heat with wood is really old, so we know that works. And um, we also know that when you um, burn it at, at extremely high temperatures in specific kinds of burners, um, you don't get the same kind of air pollution that you do from 
you know, uh, or just a kind of a normal fireplace in somebody's home. It's very different. Um, so there is enough um, methodology to uh, protect the quality of the air, which I totally agree being a public health nurse, of course, that with a pediatrician, that that's uh, very important. But um, at the same time, I think we're missing an opportunity to use this supply because it seems like we could solve a lot of problems if we did that. And uh, for whatever reason, we're running into a lot of resistance in even getting that kind of support from our own um, um, energy office at the state level um, for a long time. They have just not been interested in looking at woody biomass as an opportunity. And we know that we can co-fire with it and generate electricity um, and be very effective. And um, when I met with the National Renewable Energy Lab experts um, about this issue, they said, oh, this is just old <coughs> science. We all agree that it works. It's just a matter of being willing to use that information and actually apply it to um, practical um, construction and um, use in, in buildings across the state. And um, we first learned about it uh, when I was proposing this idea in my own community when I was a commissioner um, because the New England states have used woody biomass to heat their public schools for many, many years. So this is not new technology. It's something we could borrow and use um, that I just don't think we're talking about enough. I'm, I'm very supportive of wind and solar as well, but I don't think there's as much conversation about woody biomass. Steve? Yeah, I just want to contribute a little bit to the answers on these. <clears throat> There's a company that just moved to Colorado from California called Cool Planet. Cool Planet is going to take, this is the woody biomass uh, and non-woody biomass, the corn stalks and, and everything else. And they have the technology and the patents that they can put uh, the plants they build in every county and they can produce gasoline that can go into your car from the things, or diesel that can go into your, that kind of car. It also has a byproduct of biochar. In the pyro, it's a process of pyrolysis, which is a very low oxygen cooking rather than burning. You don't end up with ash. You end up, biochar, when put in the soil, as the Incas knew a thousand years ago, makes it more fertile and it takes less water, solves some of the water problem. They are it now, carbon. Uh, huh? It stores carbon. It stores carbon permanently. It's a for hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, uh, yeah, it sequesters. Uh, so that's on that one question. That is now a Colorado company. But the first three sites they're putting their uh, test plants in are in Louisiana. <laughs> but uh, maybe they're going to make so much stuff that they're going to have to have the pipelines in Louisiana. The other thing on carbon tax, I'll just mention, I believe. Boulder several years ago did a municipal carbon tax. So, I mean, carbon taxes, the federal government's not addressing it. Uh, they went in a whole different way. But uh, then I want to add one other thing going past my two. I, the, on this, I want to just say that the Golden Solar Tour is one of American Solar Energy Society's 1,000 or 1,200 across the country, just to make that clear. And it's the first and only one that has all of the homes videotaped and on YouTube so you can see them. If you want to see them, you can go on to the web at, and you just Google a search for Golden Solar Tours or Solar Home Tours and you'll find the link. You can see all of last year's and just starting to do the reviews on this year's. And I'll just say one more thing. Uh, you will see houses that have gone past net zero that were built 1970s. So our goal, we can't just shoot for net zero. We got to look through and go flying through net zero. And you'll see examples. I've got um, a question. Do you have a question? Yeah. Let me take a quick question to Will, and then we'll get to Rita. Um, Will, I, one of the things I know about that we talked about that I don't think other people may know about is, and it's a two-part question kind of, but you talked about some things you're doing down there in terms of having like a counseling cabin 
in the Black Forest and some, I think you said maybe therapy trails or something like that. And so I'm interested in a little, hearing a little bit more about those and about how the people that you're working with in the forest are reacting to uh, their experience in the fire. Right. Um, so we actually have you know 430 acres of land in Black Forest. Uh, most of the conference center is located on one side of the property along Shoop Road, which is where the fire burned. Uh, then our property extends to Burgess Road on the south side, uh, which is completely isolated. You can't really see any burn scar from there. Uh, we have a small cabin that used to be used uh, for staff during the summer uh, as a place for them to stay. And we've converted that into a community counseling center. Uh, we've had some diverse groups come in. We've had Catholic charities. We've had um, Aspen Point counseling. And then a few teen support groups have come in and really started using that cabin as a, uh, you know, as a, as a place to meet and do their, uh, their grief counseling there. Um, then one of the things we actually did was we put our 430 acres on a conservation easement and we've expedited that process. Um, and along the Burgess entrance, right behind that cabin, we've created, a, uh, we're starting to create a network of uh, community trails to be used. Uh, Black Forest Regional Park has been shut down. Um, so we've kind of taken over, not taken over, but we're the de facto uh, hiking spot now in Black Forest. Um, but our, our trails are actually designed uh, with grief counselors to be grief counseling trails as well. So we have pavilions and um, you know, meeting areas inside those trails where people who are seeking grief counseling can come and can, uh, you know, can uh, talk about their feelings with trained grief counselors, um, trained specialists. And it's actually neat because we built the, the community trail on our high spot so it overlooks the forest, but we built it at an angle so that you can't see the burn scar behind you. Um, and people in Black Forest live there for a reason. They love the forest. They don't like a lot of people telling them what to do. Um, so we've, you know, kind of constructed this trail to really, you know, strike, uh, strike up with the people in Black Forest. Um, and then in terms of our community response, um, like I said, people in Black Forest live there. We're not an incorporated community. Uh, you live there to get away from uh, any municipal government. Um, and so you're very much a, uh, an independent type person. Uh, the response we've gotten is, you know, there, there's been a lot of people, a lot of big tough lumberjacks, uh, who say, oh, I don't, need, uh, I don't need grief counseling if you ask them. And then you put a piece of paper in front of them out of our community resource center, and it's the first box they check off. Um, so there is a need in Black Forest uh, for grief counseling, and I think that's a need that's often overlooked. And one of the things we've been trying to do, um, in addition to our, you know, our mitigation, uh, you know, pushing for further mitigation and pushing uh, some of the logistical aspects of recovery, is we're trying to get rid of that negative stigma around seeking grief counseling. Um, and it's been playing pretty well in the community. Uh, we've had a great response from the community. Our efforts have been, you know, really well received. We've had some community events. Having a huge Halloween festival, which I'm really looking forward to. It's my favorite holiday. I get to build a haunted house. I'm pretty excited. Um, but we've been opening up our doors for community events. Um, now, how the community's responded to the county's efforts is a completely different uh, topic. Um, in short, not well. Um, there's a lot of politics being played at the county level. Um, a lot of cameras have to be there if you want to get any work done. Um, so it's been a really homegrown effort, which I think is pretty cool. Um, you know, when people you know aren't able to step in, um, we've kind of taken over those efforts, and it's been homegrown. As a grassroots organizer, I worked on President Obama's campaign in 2012. It's something I love to see. We can all relate to that. Thanks. That's great. Um, Rita, did you still have a question? Sure. What's up? I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. I, I just wanted to know, I, I was able to take advantage of the uh, stimulus monies that came out to um, put in energy efficient appliances and energy efficient services and things like that. It seemed like it really supported jobs and was, was effective and has long term impact on a personal level for people. I was wondering if there's any, I know that stimulus is a bad, bad word in Washington, but 
wondering if there's any efforts to uh, try to subsidize uh, some of that uh, changing of the energy products in the home as well as solar or whatever. Well, I don't know. I certainly hope so. I mean, I haven't heard of any new stimulus what's the word? The stimulus package that was passed before. I haven't heard anything about that. Something like that happening again. Um, does anyone else? I, I think as long as we have a, you know, such an anti-federal spending house, we're not going to get any progress done. And that's when it comes down to us putting pressure on our congressmen. Is it possible that we maybe could sell this to some of the deniers by touting the economic benefits of doing this? Instead of, we have to do this because of climate change, we're going into, if we do this, it's going to pay for itself. You know, it's going to benefit the health of the atmosphere, it's going to lower your energy costs, yada, 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 yada. yada. Because some of them seem entirely resistant. They don't care what the facts are. It's their belief that God made the planet and there's nothing we can do to change it. That's some of the problem we have. Yeah, it's always great to talk about the co-benefits. Um, not only the economic benefits, but the public health benefits. You know, so we, we, yeah, because I think lot. we might get further with some of these people by saying, here are the benefits and here's where yeah. they will pay for itself. Well, and that, that argument is there and um, we didn't, that didn't get presented really, but there, there is hard economic facts of the cost that we spend every year because the damage that climate change does and the cost that we put out there to address climate change and comparing that to the cost that we, the smaller cost that we would spend to avoid that Also, that the, the increasing cost of conventional energy. Yeah, yeah. The rapidly escalating cost of conventional energy. I want to uh, maybe close with uh, one, a point and a question. I mean, one point is that I think that the talk about adaptation, I feel, is really important. And uh, it, it sort of feels like it's a long time coming to acknowledge adaptation as a, as a worthy approach and, and that it isn't giving up or anything like that, um, but that it's realistic and that it's addressing the reality of our situation. Um, but I, and I think, as we just mentioned just now, and as you did throughout your talk, I think care better, um, the, the health issue, I think, is, is such a profound and such a compelling way to approach it. And you talked about a, a lot of the great work that we've been doing, and I think there's a lot of great work happening in Colorado, a lot of great things we're hearing uh, proposed from the EPA. Um, and, but you also mentioned the reality that uh, is, it, is it keeping pace with the, the larger effects that are coming. Do you have any sense, any, any kind of conclusion about where that balance is and how we can wrap up with um, uh, you know, that, that question of balancing? Um, yeah, so unfortunately I think we're, we're not keeping pace. Even if, we re, even if we stopped carbon emissions completely in their tracks right now, um, that, that carbon hangs out for five to ten years. And so that it's really inevitable that um, that the temperature is going to increase. Um, and so, so really adaptation is going to be part of it, um, both how, how we interact with nature um, and how our, our health system is going to have to change to, to deal with the, the damage that we've already done. And I, I think there was one more question, so why don't we get that I, I have two. a question. Um, I just would like to know if there's been any initiatives uh, for new uh, processes to put out fires earlier. For instance, I noticed with the um, uh, down south in Colorado, the major fire this year and then last year too, I believe, that it took so long for the planes to get there to put water on the fires and also that red um, substance. And uh, why can't we have uh, our own little um, state uh, service with, with pilots, blah, 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 and planes right there in the middle of Colorado to be there within a half an hour. I'm chairing the Wildfire Matters Interim Committee, and indeed that is uh, one of the subject areas that we will cover 
in our next meeting on uh, September 6th, the Friday. And uh, so you're certainly welcome, all of you, to come to the Capitol and sit in on that conversation um, starting at 9 o'clock in the morning. Um, what we have asked the Department of Public Safety to do is to put together a uh, comparative uh, sheet to let us know um, how much it will cost to um, own our own fleet and um, to compare that with uh, some other financial um, alternatives like leasing um, the planes that drop the fire retardant or um, because we know it will be costly or sharing uh, perhaps with another state like Wyoming. The other um, issue that I think everybody needs to be aware of is that um, during a major wildfire, because of the kind of winds that you deal with, it often grounds those planes or you can't get them in the air at all. And so it really is only one of many tools that you need to have and I don't think it would be wise for us to put all our eggs in one basket so to speak and spend all our money on an air fleet and not have all of the other tools that we sure, need sure. Uh, to fight fires. In fact, those ground um, methods often um, make uh, more impact in terms of controlling the fires. But uh, many of us are talking about how do we respond more quickly and so some legislation that we passed last year that I happen to sponsor in the Senate is um, called the All Hazard Response Mobilization Act. And the purpose of it is to look at ways that we can mobilize our resources, not just planes, but other things that we need more quickly to deal with fires. And just a kind of down-home example of that is, you know, maybe you've got heavy equipment like um, uh, dozers that you could um, uh, cut a road through an area to create a fire break and you need to move those that heavy equipment into that area quickly if we know where that equipment is and how to get it there more quickly because we have kind of a, a major state uh, data system that we're creating right now then we can respond much faster in terms of what crews we need, where we need them, um, heavy equipment that we need for fire breaks, fleets, all of those things that it takes to fight those fires. So um, it's a pretty grand conversation that we have about how to mobilize the resources quickly and deal with those fires as quickly as possible um, to protect structures, but also um, to minimize some of that um, air pollution that is such a major problem in general, but particularly for um, some people who um, have respiratory illnesses, no matter what their age is, whether they're children with asthma or um, elderly people with COPD or emphysema. So I think, great focus. I think we're you. really working hard to try to keep all that in balance. Thank you. All right. And I, you know, I, I don't see anybody knocking on the door, but I do think we should let you go. But we do have one more question we'll end with. And, uh, and Just a, uh, a follow-up on uh, the uh, collecting of a slash and logs. Have you ever thought of, say, maybe having a pickup so that, you know, the people who have smaller cars uh, wouldn't be able to do it? And also, uh, is there any talk about working with insurance companies for incentives or disincentives? Uh, in the in the wooey. <laughs> um, I think it's a great idea, and I'm, so far all I've seen is neighbors um, helping each other out in communities, saying, "Well, I have a pickup truck, and it truly is in my best interest to help you out because you are my neighbor, and we need to get this fuel load reduced." Um, I, I, I think it is a thought to try to help with that kind of mitigation. I know you know, particularly elderly people that live in some of our communities aren't able to do the work and aren't able to haul the slash um, and the logs, um, even if they did have, you know, pickup trucks that would manage that or back in their Subarus. Um, 
um, so uh, you know that's part of the conversation is just how do you mobilize the community just like uh, we're talking about Black Forest is a great example of local community mobilization. Uh, in terms of insurance, absolutely. Um, the Governor's Task Force has been meeting on a regular base, basis to talk about um, how the insurance industry um, interacts with this whole issue, whether they're going to continue to uh, cover homes and um, barns and other structures in the wildland urban interface and um, how much that's going to cost and uh, what happens when they refuse uh, to cover them um, and what happens to the reinsurance industry and how they react to um, these mega wildfires and the impact on the insurance industry. So um, that's um, that's a part of the conversation we're going to have on that same day. That's part of the agenda as well as to get a report from the insurance industry and the reinsurance industry about how they fit into this whole um, big puzzle of what we're need, needing to solve. So you might want to come to that meeting. It might be really interesting for you. All right. Well, great. Um, thanks. And I, I want to get uh, two quick points out.